Hello, American History Group. This is the big finish. Um, and uh, for the American Civil War, anyway. And what I want to do is start out with uh, a concept, an idea that was uh, one of the great Civil War historians, uh, Shelby Foote. And I'm probably going to give you a couple of his quotes. Uh, Shelby Foote had a trilogy he put together on the Civil War. Um, and I have it, but I just don't have it here. And it's the one I would also recommend. Shelby Foote said that uh, the Americans called their government an experiment. And in that experiment, the Americans had two great successes so far to that experiment. One was the establishing of the actual government. And the second is the administering of the government. The third one, he said, is still left to us. And that is the maintenance of the government. And in the Civil War, that was really the, one of the great questions. There's a lot of great questions, and one of them was whether the government would survive, as Lincoln said, you know, so eloquently in the Gettysburg Address, you knew I was going to throw that in there, whether this government would perish or not. And so that is to each successful generation. And the Civil War then was about ballots versus bullets. So secession to Lincoln, the bullet, is absolutely unacceptable. Now let's end the war, and why I start with that is how the war is going to end. The other historian I'm going to throw in there is a man named Jay Winnick. And Jay Winnick wrote a wonderful book, and I have it here, uh, April 1865. It's great. Christmas is coming. Do your shopping early for Shop Apocalypse is upon us, uh, Shop Ageddon, or whatever they're going to call it. Uh, so make sure you know you remember this. April 1865 by Jay Winnick. In one month <laughs> alone, so much happened. What happened? Well, a couple things. First of all, on April 9th, 1865, and last left off, Lee was being hounded by Grant. And Grant would write continuously to Lee about its possible surrender. Lee was deeply concerned about this for a couple of reasons, but mainly the idea is uh, first for himself, I think, in a way, because he wasn't sure what was going to happen to him. You know, was he going to be hanged? Was he going to be paraded uh, out down in New York City and people throw things at him? I mean, what was this going to what was going to happen? Um, and and so the other part is when you read about Lee, you really have to good story. You really have to read Lee carefully. And the idea was, as Winnick pointed out, and I agree because when Winnick went to the, the source, the primary source material, I, I think is phenomenal, is Lee was a man of dignity ultimately. And Lee did something similar to George Washington. He thought of the idea of civilian leadership above the military leadership. In other words, come back to that thing we started with of strategy and policy. Policy was in the hands of Jefferson Davis. And Jefferson Davis told Lee not to surrender. Lee now is in a very difficult position, recognizing that if he surrendered his command uh, on the terms to Grant, that this would probably end everything. And um, so Lee pondered this. It was not easy because on his shoulders was the weight if he was now going to move from military decision to a civilian decision, a, 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 an administrative decision, a policy. And Lee was not a politician. So Lee pondered this, and what he did is he turned to some of his commanding officers and he asked them, he said, what would you recommend? And Lee had a, uh, they were there at a campfire, and Lee had a young 24, 25-year-old artillery commander named E. Porter Alexander. And Lee liked him a lot. He was good. Porter Alexander was excellent. And Porter Alexander said, well, Lee, you know, we, he won't get us. No, sir, you know, we're, we're not going to surrender. And he argued that they could melt away into the mountains uh, of Virginia and Tennessee and from there continue to fight. Lee pondered this, but the problem was simple. Lee had understood what happened in Kansas and he thought this carefully about a guerrilla warfare and he recognized, basically said no. And the reason he said no is his, his exclamation, his response to these folks sitting around the fire was, if you did this, that the soldiers then would become nothing but bandits and robbers. Uh, they'd have to forage for food. They would live off of each other uh, in a sense of, uh, uh, of civilians um, taking what they could by force. Uh, on top of that, the Yankees, you knew, with looking at Grant, would not stop. You would just completely dis demolish anything. Uh, his home state of Virginia would be absolutely burned to the ground, most likely. Civil wars do not end well. How civil wars begin? is usually problematic, but how they end is even worse. I have never read of, an, of a civil war in history that end well. And you can think of a couple in our modern era. Vietnam, for example, is a civil war. Did not end well, did not end peacefully. 
Uh, you had a lot of issues between people in Vietnam, Korea, uh, and there's others. Even in modern day, you could probably think of some others, and I'm just forgetting. And with that, Lee then had in his hands the decision of what to do, and Lee decided that he would meet with Grant and see what his uh, terms would be. Now, to, to kind of turn us back just a little bit, Grant had already met with Lincoln uh, at uh, City Point, Virginia. Um, and Grant was told by Lincoln to be magnanimous, to be forgiving. And this is where you can kind of see Lincoln, after he won his second term in 1864 election, Lincoln had this thing called the Second Inaugural Address. It is the one address I would highly recommend you read. It is outside on our wall, <laughs> not just outside of our classroom that you go to. And the Second Inaugural is one most people don't read. And it's fascinating because in there is one line that will always stand the test of time. And Lincoln said, with malice toward none, with charity for all, with hatred towards none, but be forgiving. And he told Grant, be forgiving. So Lincoln is giving Grant the permission to, to end the war and to agree to terms. Now, this is abnormal. Once again, generals do not do this. This is policy and strategy. But this is Grant being told by Lincoln very clearly, the policy. And in this line, you can also see the difference between Davis and Lincoln, the leadership. And I think that's very important. Uh, David Potter, who's a really brilliant uh, historian, pointed out that if the presidents had been reversed, most likely the results may have been reversed. Now, you got to be careful, but, you know, you've got to give Lincoln tremendous credit. Let me just be honest with you. And so Grant now would meet with Lee, and it's a it's a wonderful read. And once again, I'm going to go back to this. And um, when you read about it, Lee and Grant had known each other briefly in the Mexican War. They had both crossed paths quickly. And since they were both also West Pointers, Lee would arrive first. And, and let me tell you a funny story real quick, because what's going to happen is Lee sent out his, his commanding officers to go find a suitable place for the surrender. And the, the guys wrote out, and this is an Appomattox courthouse uh, in Virginia. And uh, they wrote out, and there was this farm, this house of Wilmer McLean. And Wilmer McLean was at the first Battle of Bull Run. He had a little farmhouse that got absolutely owned by the Confederates who used it as a base of operations, then got destroyed. So Wilmer McLean said, I'm going to move as far as I can from the war. So he moved all the way to this western part of Virginia, over this area known as Appomattox Courthouse. And there, Wilmer McLean built this new little farmhouse. <laughs> comes up with these horses. And it's Lee's men who walked into Wilmer McLean's house and said, yep, this will do. <laughs> so Wilmer McLean's like, oh, my gosh, the war started in my house. It's going to end in my house. And so in came Lee, uh, and then about a little bit after noon, uh, the horse was started up again, and this would be Grant. Uh, and the two men couldn't be more opposite in dress. Uh, Lee always dressed dignified, very respectful, very firm and proper. Uh, Grant, uh, usually muddy. <laughs> Sometimes he'd wear a private's frock. You know? <laughs> you know, I mean, this is this is good. This is a nice comparison of the two. It's almost like the odd couple here. And uh, they sat at separate desks. And then Lee and Grant, when they first set eyes on each other, began to reminisce. They said, I, I, I uh, tried to recollect you in my mind, Lee said. And Grant said, I as well. And from one of the officers there of, of, of Grant, they said it. They talked as if they were long lost friends for a minute. And uh, reminisced about the Mexican War, reminisced about uh, various things like this. And then Lee finally said, I suppose we should get around to the business of the day. Grant wrote down uh, the terms of surrender, handed them to one of his officers, and handed it over to Lee. Lee then looked at it. Uh, what's amazing about this is Lee then looked it over and said, I suppose that you meant to say this instead, and scratched out. This is an amazing feature where Lee is just kind of uh, editing it. Uh, and Lee asked, and sheepishly from what I picked up uh, to Grant, you know, the idea that um, it would be nice if his men could keep their horses for the spring planting. Now you gotta understand horses in the 1860s, this is like the equivalence of cavalry. Um, this would be almost like in modern day, a commanding officer say, oh, by the way, you know, we should be able to keep our tanks and you know, our planes and things like this, and our helicopters. And Grant said, yes, I, I suppose that'll do. I mean, it's just a weird ending. And with that, the signature was done, uh, two shook hands when I read and off they went. Uh, Lee went and informed his men. And the hard-fought 
bloody engagement came to a, a, a standstill for that point in April 9th, 1865. Now, it wasn't over. Uh, you still had some other uh, cavalry and you had some other Confederates out there. Uh, Sherman uh, was out hunting down one of them. And um, what would happen is that would be the last major engagement in North Carolina where, uh, you know, you'd have another surrender. But on April 9th, once Lincoln got hold of this news, he was absolutely elated. Finally, he said, the blood will end. Finally, the death will end. And finally, the Union can be one the nation. And with this, uh, you know, Lincoln was so excited. You know the rest. He's going to decide on April 14. Uh, give a wonderful speech about this. And then he's going to decide to go to uh, Ford Theater, which turned to be a tragic event. And um, in the audience, there was a man who already had a, a plan hatched named John Wilkes Booth. Um, I mentioned Booth earlier. Booth had, excuse me, Booth had fought, or Booth had been in the uh, regiment detachment, uh, the Richmond Grays at the hanging of John Brown. <laughs> Booth was a very deep Southern Confederate, a Marylander, and Booth now made the decision that instead of kidnapping Lincoln, uh, he's going to kill him. And the assassination must take place. Now, it's not just Booth. Booth has some other collaborators here. One of my favorites is a man named George Adzerat. If I got his name last time, he's a German immigrant, came over. And it's a hit list. Uh, each one is kind of given a person to, to go get. Uh, Adzerat was supposed to go get Andrew Johnson. He didn't. Um, the funny part, another good story, is where uh, there's a young man named Lewis Powell. I'm going to call him that. He had a couple aliases who had fought, actually, at Gettysburg for the Confederates. Lewis Powell, big hulking guy, I suppose go kill William Seward, Secretary of State. And the story is uh, Powell showed up, knocked on Seward's door, um, and uh, it was answered. Powell bursts in, um, roughs up the guy, then begins to walk upstairs. Uh, there's Seward's son. Seward's son tried to stop him. He roughed up Seward's son. He goes in, and there's a male nurse there uh, tending to Seward, um, who had been in an accident. Uh, he beats up on the male nurse, um, and then there is Seward laying there, and from what I picked up, Powell took out this big knife, and he began, he said, okay, now I'm going to plunge it in and kill uh, William Seward, Secretary of State, and as he began to try to stab him, uh, he didn't make any contact, and the reason is he keeps hearing this, this metal clinking, is Seward was in his body cast, and the knife was penetrating, because Seward had been in a carriage accident. And so the male nurse came to and the son and so on, and they got up on Powell and then Powell ran off into the dark. He would later on be found, later on be executed. But that's, that's the idea. There is a hit list and there is a conspiracy and there's some wonderful books on it. And uh, John Wilkes Booth, of course, would do the dastardly deed in Ford's Theater, uh, jump to the stage, uh, six Semper Tyrannis, and thus to all tyrants, he would argue or, or yell out and run off into the night. And then the, the search for Booth became something of legend. And it's an amazing story to read. Once again, I'm going to refer to this one, but there's others. And when you come back, I've got a lot of different information I can give you on this. And I'll give you a couple of sheets that are pretty interesting to read. But anyway, um, the death of Lincoln was probably the death of any good chance of that malice toward none, charity for all for the South. Uh, it would turn to a series of other leaders, including the guy named Andrew Johnson, the vice president who become president. This was not good. Um, and so I don't want to get into that right now, but I just want to kind of summarize a little bit of the Civil War. And I'm going to do the aforementioned Shelby Foote again, uh, his quote. Shelby Foote had a wonderful quote where he said, basically, the Civil War defined us as what we are today and it opened up to us what we became. It was the crossroads of our being. It was a hell of a crossroads. I've given you an essay to read uh, by James McPherson uh, on the war that never goes away. And in there, I, I pointed out the question of the key question of how was this a crucial test for the nation, as McPherson argued. I hope that as we piece this together, you can see this. In the center of it was this problem of liberty and slavery, ultimately, not just saving the nation, but defining it. And Lincoln even had a great a couple of great speeches about liberty where he said no one has a really good definition of liberty. <clears throat> and it's very true. We say liberty, what do we mean? We mean absolute liberty. We can do whatever we want, whenever we want. Uh, the need for government is in there. Government is a necessity. Yet government usually seems to have an intrusion to our liberties. 
Yet at the same time, how can you exhibit liberty without any form of government? The American founding was based on this problem and this dilemma. And ever since we've been struggling with this problem and dilemma, it's not new, it's old. And I think that's the comfort I find by studying these folks. Uh, another book, shameless plug, I guess, James McPherson, you know, uh, Abraham Lincoln, the Second American Revolution, another one you must get. And uh, so in this, McPherson uh, delves into this idea of what do we mean by uh, and what what is this civil war really about? And it's 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 a problem for us today. It is not opposite of what we want today. It is the very essence of why the United States exists and what in this larger picture, as Lincoln said, what the American nation means for the world. It is the last best hope for mankind in the sense of government. Um, we make fun of democracy. It's got some weird quirks to it. But what is the alternative? Um, if you think of a larger grandiose picture, World War II, why would these fellows, these young folks, go so far away from their home uh, and uh, die on foreign shores? For what purpose and what reason? No less than the ones at Gettysburg or Antietam. Uh, as Lincoln said in another speech, from hearthstone, you know, to head to tombstone. Basically, I mean, I mean, we 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 are connected. And that's what history is about. It's within us. Uh, James Baldwin, one of my favorite writers, had that comment that history is not what you read. It's 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 within us. It connects us. It's part of us. And in current situation, last especially last 50, 60, 70 years, it's been about the word civil rights. When we say liberty, we do mean political and civil rights. And it is through our government that we have these political and civil rights. That's the point of these principles. They, they cannot vanish. And Lincoln summarizes so well in the Gettysburg Address. I got to keep going back to that. The Gettysburg Address goes from past to present to beyond. And it's the one thing I would emblazon and put up somewhere where you can see it regularly. And the answers that we look for, that we hope for, are, are, are not always somewhere way off in the distance. It's somewhere near us. It's somewhere in us. It's somewhere in the past, I believe. But I think that past needs to be applied to a present. It doesn't mean that the technology we got is bad. It doesn't mean the media is awful. Let me, let me just be real clear about that because the media of the 19th century, the period we're talking about, was just as divisive, and just as derisive as it is today. It's just we get it faster. Um, it's a good time we live in. I know what I'm saying it's a good time. You know, my dad, who fought World War II, uh, Great Depression kid, had a great line in which he said, you know, the good old days are today. Because think of a guy who had went, went through the Great Depression, fought in foreign shores of World War II, was shot up by the Japanese, um, was in a hospital for two, two and a half years. They were going to amputate his arm. He said, the hell if you are. He kept the arm. <laughs> um, you know, good old days to him. when not sitting on that beach getting shot up and, you know, you know trying to figure out where your next meal was going to come. The good old days are now. We got to make those. But we have to understand and I think that's the thing I hope for you guys, especially. Read, think, you know, cry. You know, didn't 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 Jimmy V say that? It's been a hell of a day. So you guys take care. Miss you. <laughs>